Welcome to the Potion Podcast, your raw look at the hospitality industry, brought to you by SHC. I mean, I'm, I'm loving it because I, I um, you know, when I worked at Pono, the central, the central office for Pono is obviously in France, right? And when I worked for Seagram's, I was working for Seagram's in, in, in England and their central office was, I think, Canada or I know the famous Seagram's building in, in New York. And, and, and so I've never worked this closely with the central office. And so, of course, it's a whole it's a whole different world. It's shareholder value, you know, like it's it's where the, the hub of the machine is. You know, so it's a whole it's a whole different world than being in one of these sort of non um, you know, sort of a, like a little setup zone for the company. You know, it's Pernod Ricard USA, but it's but the Pernod Ricard mothership is Paris, right? And now I'm in the mothership with Brown Foreman, and so it's a whole new um, level of learning for me. And of course, I love it. <laughs> it's not, not, nothing but exciting, you know. I'm a kid in the candy store, you know. I mean, from a personal point of view, Jack Daniels is one of the greatest brand lockups, and 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 the simplicity is it's this black and white brand that just you cannot fail to recognize it anywhere that you see it you know like i mean if ever there was a master of marketing spirits uh, you know i'm at the, the, the hub of it really right now and i've worked on some pretty major brands that have done pretty well in the past so <laughs> so where are you based these days nashville oh wow by, by the way are we interviewing right now or are we is... this is how this is how i roll oh perfect i i didn't i had no idea I, the thing is, is like uh, with the post shift, I don't do a lot of research on my people that I speak to. Um, I like it to be organic and the interviewee sort of take the, take the reins and sort of, as they're doing, I write down notes and then I bring up, I bring back points of what I sort of was like, Oh, that's kind of cool. I didn't know that about you. And the great thing is, is I've talked to good, good friends um, on the show and learned things about them that I never knew about them before. Because it's something you don't talk about. No, because all, all, all we ever are is the tales of the cocktail talking exactly. about. Oh, really? Jerry Thomas was the first cocktail book you've got? What did you think about? <laughs> well, I, I was having, I'm I was kidding. That's, that's, not, that's not the conversations. The conversations are usually tequila shot. <laughs> well, the thing is, I, I have a, I've had, com- I had a conversation with someone the other day, and I've known her for 15 years. I was talking to Lauren Martin John, and I mentioned something about my upbringing in the country and like not wearing shoes until I was 18 years old because I I literally grew up in the, in, in the sticks. And she's like, excuse me, what? I'm like, yeah, I I wore bare feet to school. My graduating high school class was 62 people. Is it like Canadian hillbilly? Well, yeah. is, that, is well, that you? <laughs> my, my wife has seen me go feral a couple of times, like when we go when we go bush. But like in Australia, like I grew up in a town of 350 people, like up in the mountains. You know, so. What, what part of Australia was that? Sunshine Coast, up on the in the mountains behind the Sunshine yeah, Coast. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. That's so I went to a, I went to a high school with 450 kids. Oh, <laughs> that's right. It's amazing so but this interview is not about me it's about you and so uh let's let's kick it off like i always like to ask what the origin story is of simon like what the origin story is where did you start bartending if you can remember (laughs) i know i so i actually i i started in this industry in a completely different way to 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 most and when i say you know i'm that's a guess of course but um i didn't start bartending I started in uh, working in wine shops uh, and, 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 and I worked for a particularly brilliant company called Oddbins back in England. And, and just as the name suggests, Oddbins was, they would go and look for these crazy things. And, and back when I was working for them, uh, it was all about, they, they were the first you know, in company to bring Greek wines into England, for example, you know, I'm talking about the nineties now, you know, and, 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 and we sold all the first growths too, you know, Margot, Mouton, you know, all the Eshazos, the great Burgundies, you know, for example, we, we, we had all of that, but we also had all of this crazy stuff. I mean, they, they we're bringing all of those old pen folds. You think about it in the nineties, the bin 707 was the, was the money back, back in the day. So I started working in wine shops and I did that. I started almost, I was 19 when I got a 20 hour a, a, a week gig in a wine shop. And at that point, wine to me was dry or medium. <laughs> and, and, I'll, and I'll never forget, never forget sharing this, you know, I, 
the, the guy that was my boss was like, all right, what should we drink? And I'm like, I prefer a medium if we could do that. And he's like, how did you get this job? <laughs> and of course, you know, a, a friend of mine had recommended me for the job. He said, and he trusted that person, hired me. And of course I knew nothing about wine. <laughs> so, but, but that was the, that was the beginning of the end really for me because he gave me a bottle of wine. I remember this wine to this day. It was from Cahors and he said, go home and write notes on it. And I had a French girlfriend at the time. So even though there was no internet to go look it up and I had no library of wine books to, to, to reference, I was like, how am I going to figure out what, uh, what to write about this wine for this, uh, for my boss the next day. And, um, the, the, the girl I was dating went, oh, my family has a home there. Um, that's in the Lot Valley. Uh, they, it's a Malbec. They're known as the Black Wines of France. And, and I'm like, oh, wow. And I'm writing all this down. So I took, it, took all those notes back to him the next day. He's like, wow. He goes, I thought I was going to catch you out there. And he gave me a bottle of Burgundy from my second bottle. And that was it. I thought I only liked medium wines. Medium white wine, please. White wine spritzer. And the next thing I know, I'm hooked on red wine and very, you know, you know, interesting red wines right from the beginning. And it just went from there. And I fell in love with almost every wine region in the world as I got to know it and did that for several years. How, and, and did you stay in wine? Like where was the, cause obviously you have a passion and a knowledge for wine, which again, like this is what I love about this. I didn't know that you had that sort of passion and knowledge for wine. Where was the, the crossover? Well, it, I tell you, it's, it's, it's interesting. I mean, it starts right from the beginning. So this company, Oddbins, so they had this this sort of appetite for the strange and the extraordinary, I'll say. And so not only was sort of, say, malt whiskey in a slump at the time, so they decided to become malt whiskey specialists, and we had a massive shelf, so I started getting into single malts during that period. They would look for things that were crazy and weird, and so um, they would bring in things like chartreuse. So we had chartreuse in the 90s. You know, we had, I remember when the first, um, the first time I ever... Um, got um, um, a, a Pisco and I remember the first time, you know, we've got Caipirinha in and this is all before I've ever really sunk my teeth into anything to do with cocktails. So some of the first cocktails I ever made was a Pisco Sour just because it was written on the bottle, the first one in a Caipirinha. I actually called my cat at the time Cachaca because I liked the Caipirinha <laughs> so much back in the day. And so, so I was, I was, you know, dab dabbling in it a little bit. And I, chartreuse actually really struck me as one of these um, spirits that really drew me in because Ralph Steadman, and he's obviously this incredibly famous and accomplished artist, did all of the artwork for our business. And he drew this ad campaign up for chartreuse. And it's, it said something along the lines of, it. it's incredibly strong. It's a crazy color. It's made by people that don't talk to each other or anybody else buy it or whatever, it was something along those lines. And the next thing I knew, I was finding myself in Veron, uh, which is near Rhone Valley, so I was going for wine as well. But when I went out for the wine trip, I decided to sneak over and see Chartreuse and visit that for the very first time. So I was getting interested in um, spirits through the, through the avenue of wine right from the very beginning, but I didn't know how much that knowledge would seriously sort of impact my career when I moved over to, over to spirits. But I would say another significant um, part of the story is the wine shop I would end up running for Oddbins, or one of the ones I would end up running for Oddbins was in the, on the Strand in London. And it was a stone's throw away from all of the theatres and it was a stone's throw away from the Savoy Hotel. Now back then I had hair down to hair Rage Against the Machine was my favorite band. It was Rage Against the Machine, Public Enemy. And, you know, that was, that was, that was my style. I would wear combat trousers. And so even though I would work with um, the team at the Savoy Hotel on finding the weird and wonderful and strange things for all of their guests, because they would get crazy guests from all over the world that would want a particular type of water or a particular type of whiskey, they'd come to me to see if I could source it. Um, so I was having a lot of fun with the Savoy. But back then... They wouldn't let me in because <laughs> of my look. <laughs> it's, it's, less, it's less strict now, but back then you really did need a jacket. And I remember the first time I did decide to go in and have a drink and I didn't have a jacket and they went and got one for me. It was, you know, lots of um, airs and graces at the Savoy. And I don't mind that. I think it's, you know, fun to still have places that, that, that you know, that sort of have those standards now. But, you know, as, as, as society has gone on, so has the sort of the, the, the sense of doing things in a proper fashion like that. So you can wear your jeans to the Savoy now, which is fine because that's all I really want to wear. <laughs> was, was Dorelli there at that time? 
he was, I didn't really have, I, I had some interactions with him on a business level, but we didn't really, um, we didn't really establish a friendship until, and it was, this is very interesting, but I got a job uh, working for Seagram's directly from working in that wine shop. Seagram's actually owned that wine shop. So um, uh, that wine group, as, as it were, uh, uh, that chain of, of, of stores of Seagram's were the biggest spirits company in the world. And I went over to a company called Ideal Brands. Um, Ideal Brands was founded by Oliver Paynton. And Oliver Paynton is probably one of the most significant uh, names in the emergence of of cocktail and restaurant culture in, in England at that time. He opened the Atlantic Bar and Grill, which was the place where everybody went. Of course, he gave one whole area of that, one whole room, should I say, to Dick's Bar, Dick Bradsell's Bar. You know, this is the 90s. I mean, every celebrity had their party there and you could get, and it was this beautiful Art Deco room and you could get beautifully made and served martinis. Every drink was, was, was fantastic. The bar team there was incredible too. So he set up something called, um, ideal brands and they would import spirits that um you couldn't otherwise get so it was sort of going against the grain of the mainstream at the time uh but back then you know we're talking the 90s that was absolute vodka and brands like that they were just growing they were tiny you know certainly in, in the uk it was and, and they were the, the cool brands to have and of course absolute was with you know you know david bowie and all of the art the art set, you know, Damien Hurst. So that was, that was quite cool to sort of be a part of that. Now, I love gin always, right? This is, this is going to be the theme of our conversation. <laughs> you know, right? So, you know, I was never really the vodka guy, even though I start, join, I joined Idol Brands, whose flagship brand was probably, um, whose flagship brand was um, Absolute. They still had um, a whiskey in the portfolio. They had champagnes and things in the portfolio. It wasn't just, um, vodka and it was all exciting brands and in and those brands was this really old dusty looking bottle that no one thought was cool and that was Plymouth Gin and, and, and that was the brand that I fell in love with and because I fell in love with Plymouth Gin out of all of the brands within the portfolio which no one else really did at the time because it wasn't cool you know it was better to have the much sexier products that everyone wanted rather than the old dusty bottle that no one wanted um, my boss a gentleman by the name of Nick Blacknell uh, he sent me down to the Savoy he said you need to talk with Dorelli and he sent he gave me the copy of the Savoy cocktail book and I went down and that afternoon I spent the entire afternoon with Peter Dorelli we made every single gin cocktail in um, in, in, in the Savoy cocktail book, we have this like massive table just filled with drinks I you know I mean this is before social media and yeah. you had to take a picture of your camera but, but um so i got to know peter Dorelli quite well that that day um there, i have very little other recollection other than all of the drinks and you know trying to documentation and cocktails and it started there i mean i I, could, I couldn't have been luckier um when it comes to getting an education in cocktails the moment i walked into that job because i think the second thing that they made me do was go on the road with uh, made me do but the second assignment I had was going on the road with Douglas Ankara, who was the, uh, you know, the head of the, the lab bar, Dick Bradsall, um, Colin Appiah, who was actually at a bar called the Ring of Bells in Bath in England at the time, which is my hometown. Um, a guy called Sebastian Hamilton Mudge, who was uh, running a bar called Pulp in Bristol at the time. And um, there was, we, we created a thing called the Hit Squad and we went around England in a Diamante car that was designed by this uh, designer called Sean Clarkston, stopping off at different bars and teaching them how to do the fundamental basics of shake a drink, stir a drink, measure a drink, use a jigger, things that weren't really being done at the time. And I was just watching the masters inspire more bartenders around the country, went up and down the country. I remember getting, you know, driving in the car with Douglas Ankara, uh, all the way down to Bristol and Bath, which is my hometown, and we got to know each other and become friends on that journey. Then I drove Dick Bradsell down to Brighton in England. We became friends on that journey. Spike Merchant was also on that tour. So it was a, you know, a, a team of, I would say, in, inspirational bartenders that were there at the very sort of birth of this reincarnation of cocktail culture. And I kind of got to sort of be there and witness it and see it and that was my beginning <laughs> <laughs> that's a pretty good beginning like if, if we're talking about origin stories of getting into cocktails like most yeah. people are like oh yeah i saw my bar manager shake up a, a cosmopolitan and i was hooked 
Well, well, the irony, the, the, well, the, I, I don't know if irony is the right word, but the, the, but the funny part of this is, at this point, I've still never been a bartender. <laughs> so did, that, you, did you ever get into bartending then? Yeah, so, so I've been, I'm, just as I saw these guys inspiring this group of bartenders up and down the country, I'm completely inspired um, by them too. And I'm inspired by what they're showing me. You know, Spike had a bar called The Alphabet. The lab bar just bedazzled me back in those days, these giant slings that they were making, you know, and there was Salvatore Calabresi doing his breakfast martinis at the Langham. You know, um, it was all, I was just like wide-eyed. I was like, I've never seen anything like this before. So I wanted to be a bartender. That's it. I, you know, like here I am as a, as a, essentially a brand ambassador and I want to go from being a brand ambassador into being a bartender. And I will tell you the guy that really sort of was the icing on the cake of inspiring me. It was a gentleman by the name of Wayne Collins. And we went to a restaurant called, I mean, and it closed down, but it's called, um, it was called High Holden. And he made me my first Sazerac. And I just learned that you put loads of ice in a glass and you know, and you, or you stir a drink that's up. I'd never been given a glass, a, a drink in a rocks glass that didn't have any ice, which is how he served this Sazerac. And I kind of felt a little bit ripped off because it was expensive, <laughs> like, you know, like that. And, 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 and then I tasted it. And of course it was absolutely divine. And he waxes poetic, the story of the Sazerac, a story I've never heard before. I'm like immediately like, where does this guy come from? Like, you know, it's an encyclopedia. And um, I was with, again, I was with my boss, Nick Blacknell, and he's like, we got to hire this guy. So we hired him as a brand ambassador and he came on board. And um, on his first day in the office, he gets given his laptop computer and laptops back then were like this thick. <laughs> and, you know, I hand him his computer and he's like, what the fuck is this? You know, like that, you know? I'm like, it's a computer. He goes, oh, I thought you wanted me to come here and like teach people bartending and stuff. He goes, yeah, but you're gonna have to do an email. He goes, nah, why don't you keep that and put an extra two grand in my salary? <laughs> 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 anyway, we came to a little understanding, Wayne and I, that uh, I, would, I would teach him the computer and he would teach me bartending. Um, and so around uh, 2000, Seagram's goes into um, liquidation, uh, the company, it, it, you know, a series of, of bad mistakes by, uh, or bad acquisitions and bad luck in the marketplace for some of those acquisitions. They ended up having to sell off the biggest spirits company in the world. There was no one big enough to buy them. Some of the spirits went to Allied Demet, some of them went to Diageo, some went to Pono, Ricard. It, it, was, it was split up all, all across the board. And of course I was, um, you know, made unemployed in that process. And so that was it. I was going to bartend. <laughs> so you did go from brand ambassador to bartender. What? So this is 2000. Oh, really? 2000. Wow. Um, so oh, yeah. we, we, we're talking Shambord was the, was the, like, <laughs> oh, the, the I catch <laughs> It was the ketchup of um, ketchup of uh, bartenders the long before Chambord. That was how you did something that was extra fancy. You put Chambord in it. <laughs> and if you had every flavor of Absolute on your back bar and every Bacardi flavor, like you were passing a really good ketchup bar. Like you were the legit. Um, so how long did you bartend for before you, before you moved into the position I think everybody pretty much knows who for you from? So that's the true confession, isn't it? I didn't bartend for that long. So, um, <laughs> and this might be the first time this is ever coming out. <laughs> I have that effect on people. <laughs> yeah. The, um, so, so I actually opened a bar um, called Coba, uh, K-O-B-A in the town of Brighton in England, which was sort of, and I think a lot of people I know have been in a situation where you, uh, I, you yourself have been in a situation where you open the first bar that is going to attempt to bring cocktail culture to a city um, and now you're in a position where you've got to try and convince people to spend three times as much as a beer on a drink that's half the size you know like you know a, 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 that they've never heard of um, and and so you sort of you, you run to lower margins than you normally would to entice people in and you start doing things like table serve that is you know this is pub English pub culture you're going against in, the, in this year um, so I, but we opened up a bar called Coba and it was above, interestingly enough, an Ogbins wine shop that I used to be the manager of. Uh, I, I knew that it had a license um, and there was a space upstairs 
um, and it was so it was an upstairs bar. You had to go up a, a set of stairs, so that's always a challenge in itself. And it was um, not quite on the right side of town uh, uh, as well. But um, I persuaded a gentleman, Jake Kempston, his name. He owned a hotel nearby to invest in the bar, or I mean, it was his bar ultimately. And we built this cocktail bar together. Uh, everything from sanding the the tables down to upholstering the you know the 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 the, the, the furniture, you know to plumbing in the bar, the whole, the whole works, you know, we built a roof garden that had fresh herbs, mostly mint for doing mojitos, that we could just walk out the back door of the bar and grab the fresh mint. And uh, I wrote all of the cocktail menus and most of it, again, another confession was stolen from Milk and Honey London and the lab bar. I think I had about five original drinks on, on that menu, which we didn't really change that often either. Um, it won best cocktail menu and I'm like, oh God, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can come best of my sins on the stage while I'm accepting this award <laughs> but um but it but it made a mark on Brighton and it was open for 10 years which was good and I I, I bartended there for a year so I definitely got uh, enough experience through that year um it was probably about a year year and a half and then I got offered a job because um, we never made any money in that bar and I was working on sweat equity and I was making nothing, you know, it was one of those situations. And so I get offered a job to go and be the global brand ambassador for Plymouth Gin, which was kind of an offer at the time, but I could not refuse. Um, I continued to pull in shifts at that bar for until about 2004 and wrote all the cocktail menus and did their training manuals until that point too. So, you know, you know, one, two years, I mean, I had good training and I, I actually think I, you know, a lot of people are going to laugh when I say this, but I actually think I was quite a, nat a natural. <laughs> <laughs> but to make money on the side, I was doing a lot of event bartending for um, a company called Peters and Beach at the time. And we were doing things like Madonna's, part, you know, Madonna's parties and, you know, and the, the Channel 4, but, you know, Christmas parties. And we were doing, you know, high volume, um, you know, batched cocktails and this is you know 2000 2001 2002 for parties to two three thousand people that's where i excelled interestingly enough i was better at that than i was uh behind the bar trying to sort of orchestrate like tom cruise does you know <laughs> king of the batch <laughs> yeah so exactly really like a global position with plymouth at that time like i think i always try to remind a lot of younger bartenders these days like pre-internet pre a lot of things like the brand ambassador position, especially a global brand ambassador position wasn't like a well-known or like a, a thing that was kind of a thing, I suppose at the time in the industry. We, 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 you know, I was talking to Ben Reed recently. They, did you see that thing that he did? That was um, 20 years of the English bartender yep. scene. And, and I think in that they, they, they listed Wayne Collins, as the first brand ambassador, interestingly enough. So it, 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 you know, it sort of started almost there. They didn't quite consider my job that I was doing for Ideal Brands a brand ambassador job in the true sense of the word, because I had a bit of sales and field marketing and, you know, it, you know, and I wasn't really qualified to do education at the time. That's something I was learning while I was on the job. Um, but in 2002, there were a handful, you know, I think Daniel Lundhammer and Max Warner were doing Shivers quite brilliantly. And um, there were some Scotch guys um, do, doing, doing their work. Um, but most of it was local, I think, you know, uh, outside of that. And I, um, and I think I, the fact that I got to come to the United States is where I got to make my mark on what a brand ambassador was doing in the UK and in Europe. I got to bring that style of brand ambassador to the US. And that was, that was interesting because in 2002, which is the sort of year I started really doing that in the US, um, cocktail culture was just sort of getting going there as well. You know, I, I remember those early years too, you know, Dale DeGroff doing his cocktail safaris and, and taking me around uh, all of his sort of favorite bars when I, got, when I got to town. In fact, he was the first person I called up when I got, when I got to New York. Um, which was in 2002, which was great. He took me to the Rainbow Rooms, and, you know, all, all of the, the classic old school bars. I remember always spending a lot of time at Bemelman's Bar when Audrey was there. I, I got myself a little apartment on 92nd Street, 
sort of getting down to Bemelman's was uh, everyone was like, why are you up in the Upper East Side back then? You know, like no, no, like they thought it was crazy. I was like, because it's cheap. The um, the the uh, yeah, I'd go see Audrey at Bemelman's all the time, and I just happened to be in New York when it was getting going. So if I if I was lucky enough to see, you know, Alphabet and the Lab Bar and the Atlantic Bar getting the London scene going, and sort of being a part of that, and then I come to the U.S. when it's just evolving from being you know Dale de Groff into a slightly, you know, bigger world. So I was at the opening of the Flatiron Lounge. In fact, I met Judy Reiner when that was a building site and went in and did a pitch on uh, uh, Plymouth Gin. And of course, I'd probably done 20, 30 pitches that week and they'd all fell flat on their face because no one's like, no one wants another gin. And of course, the first bar I walked into where, uh, you know, someone wanted another gin, you know, so I had Audrey, um, you know wanted another gin and and now and now it was julie and i'm like oh this is amazing you know and so those would be my people right at the very beginning the people to hold my hand through the um whole period of time in um in new york and what great influential people they are on the on the whole cocktail movement so i was very lucky um yeah so the pegu club open went to the opening of employees only i saw it all happening and growing you know uh, I, you know, Death and Company too. I mean, Death and Company was interesting because I, by the time Death and Company opens, I'm living on the same street as where they're opening, and no one would let them open. And I would go to the courthouse and try and support David Kaplan and his team to get that bar open. You know, they needed their license, and so I was at the night courts down in Chinatown, you know, supporting David Kaplan's uh, idea of bringing a speakeasy to my neighbourhood, which I desperately wanted. You know, it was quite interesting because everyone was like, "It's going to be the noise," and I'm like hold on a minute, he's turning a dive bar into a fancy cocktail lounge. I think it's going to be less noisy. Just, just thinking that. <laughs> so, so yeah, be, being a brand ambassador, all, all of that was going on was great. And there were definite synergies because I was one of the few people that was really selling through education at the time. And that's what this new style and type of bar and bartender wanted. Well, cause yeah, cause I think, uh, again, goes back to how lucky we are in this day and age. Like, the how many how often do we still see articles now of the resurgence of gin and those yeah. resurgence of gin <laughs> articles have been like circulating for the last like decade and a bit um i think that was that's always been one thing when people have talked to me and i've talked to smaller brands about doing education and stuff is your mentality of educating people about gin and then educating them about your brand has yeah. was sort of a change instead of just the massive sales pitch um of like here's my brand it's the best um and and that's that's changed the way people think about gin but what were the hurdles back in those days like even now with the craft cocktail movement being so huge there's still it's still such a niche market in the grand scheme of things what what were the massive challenges to overcome then to just try and have someone taste your product or know about your product especially plymouth which is a completely different style of gin altogether yeah i think the biggest challenge was that no one was um was drinking gin and there had been the same four bottles on the back bar all great gins incidentally but really apart from bombay sapphire mostly gathering dust during that period and um and hendrix obviously saw saw it in 2000 when they launched they they were actually a couple of years ahead of me going to the us with their launch because i remember walking into a bar albert trammer's bar it's called town and getting my first cucumber martini when they hadn't launched Hendrix in, in the, uh, the UK at that point either, I was like, wow, what is this stuff? And cucumber martini, how odd, you know, you know, I shouldn't have thought how odd given, given what they were doing at the Met bar, Ben, you know, Ben Reed and Jasper Ayers, Ben Pundle doing at the Met bar, their watermelon martinis and everything. But I, I did find it quite odd to see it. And, um, but there was a, there was a gin that had sort of saw the potential that in a world where there was, I mean, this is how I was looking at it in 2001, 2002. This, every back bar was 90% vodka. And all these back bars had four bottles of gin. And um, so just to be the, and the gin market was still significant and big enough, just to be the fifth bottle on that back bar of gin, you could actually have a good business, right? So I think Hendrix saw that. And I think that when Charles Rolls, who took over Plymouth Gin with John Murphy in um, uh, 2006, that was, damn, that's a long time ago. Not 2006, sorry, 1996. So they were the 
the, honestly, the first visionaries of the new modern gin world, in my opinion, they, um, when, when they saw those opportunities, I think that they were seeing that there were very few gins on the market. And so out of necessity, you had to educate people. It was, I would go in and no one said, no one drinks gin anymore. And I'm like, I don't think people understand the category of why they should really enjoy gin. And every cocktail, it was a gin cocktail that was still around as a classic. It had been hijacked by the vodka category. So Gimlet was vodka now. A martini was vodka now. So there was a lot of, um, a little bit of turf war to, to turn around and go, that's not a proper Gimlet. This is a proper Gimlet, you know, and this is why. And, and so, I, I mean, I, I, I loved the challenge. You know, you know the, people say um, it must have been really challenging, and it was because there was a lot of no's. But I, I kept, I, I had this, this mantra in my head. I was like, you may not buy this today, but one day you're going to buy this. That was how I kind of felt every time. I, I truly believed every time I walked in with the bottle and every time I got a no that if I walk back in that bar two years from now, they'll have it. You know, whether they bought it from me or they just now, the trend had happened. So I somewhere inside had this deep, deep rooted belief that it was going to come and it was going to happen. It's not a win today, it's a win tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, so, exactly. How long were you with Plymouth? Uh, well, so Charles uh, and, and, and his team, Charles Rolls and his uh, team and John Murphy, they, they, I think they bought Plymouth in 96. They, they 1996, they, they had an uh, automatic win in England because that brand was almost dead at that point. It's the oldest industry in the world. It was almost dead. They had an automatic win with Jancis Robinson giving it a great review. And of course, it sort of suddenly got a consumer following and with that consumer following ideal brands kind of sort of saw it and said well that's an opportunity to bring uh, that product that's got this great review by Jancis Robinson to to bartenders so in 98 that Plymouth Gin joins ideal brands and that's when I joined I ideal brands and so I'm automatically in love with this brand Plymouth Gin at the time so I worked on it from 98 to 2000 uh, and then Seagram's sort of folded and that's when I went to bartending. Um, so I'd had two years with the brand in that environment. I go and bartend and then the person that they'd hired to do the global work on, on Plymouth Gym, which was, who was a friend of mine and a former boss, um, Eleanor Dodd, she, um, she got pregnant and decided she didn't want to do the travel associated with um, running the Plymouth Gym brand. So they called me up and asked me if I wanted to do it. So that was nine, uh, 2002. And by in 2005, that brand got sold to the Absolute Spirits mm -hmm. Company. You might remember that. And so I thought I was going to be out of a job at that point. But they asked me if I would like to go to either Stockholm or New York. And I thought, wow, the chance to work in the United States. I didn't think I'd ever get that opportunity. So I, I, I jumped at the chance and I went to work for the Absolute Spirits Company running Plymouth Gin in, in, uh, out of New York in 2006. March 2006, I moved. To, the, to New York. And then um, Pernod Ricard came along and bought that company. And I thought I was gonna lose my job at that point too. But I just kept, in fact, everyone sort of saw what we're doing as, a, as, as valuable and as a positive. So we, I kept kind of getting promoted within, within the system. Couldn't believe it. Every single time I was scratching my head, I'm like, how is it me that's getting promoted? I, and I, I still to this day think it's because they, don't really know, they didn't really know what I was actually doing. <laughs> <laughs> But we can't get rid of this guy in case what he's doing is of, 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 um, of value. So I sort of stuck with the brand all the way through. So even though my job evolved, you know, at one point I'm the um, director of brand education and trade outreach for all of the Pono Ricard portfolio, which means looking after every brand ambassador and, and you know, a, a, a apparently having a proper job. Um, I was still working on Plymouth Gin right through to that point. So you could probably say I was working on that brand for 15 years. So one thing that I was curious about, because I've, I've had actually had a couple of people that I've interviewed, Claire Burton Lang and stuff like that, um, give props to you about your sort of marketing and sort of the direction and, and sort of folding in the advocacy thing there. Like, was that self-taught as you sort of went along or did you sort of reach out? Because it is the hard thing is I think sometimes people think brand ambassadors are just those guys who go into the bar, drink, pay with the company credit card, talk about the product, do a seminar and done. And from what I've heard about your role and what you've told me in the past, like it really is you encompassed like the voice of Plymouth Gin in every 
at possible facet with a team of people. Yeah, I, and, and, and then other brands came to me, you know, Jameson's, Absolute, and we started working on all of it in that fashion. I, 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 I just had a deep-rooted belief that, that um, the bartender was an important stakeholder in all of this. And a lot of brands at the time felt that if you had a consumer pool, you had to, a bar would have to order that product. And I, and I, I kept pointing out that that is not the case. And in fact, it, could, it couldn't be further from, from the truth. It, you know, if you don't, if you don't um, engage them, then you will lose your, your, you know, one of your key stakeholders, you know? So I, I, you know, watching certain people working on big brands be shocked that their big brand was not stocked in a cool bar, you know, it, like they, they, they would be like, huh, how comes you don't have this product? And I'm like, it's obvious you haven't engaged them. Mm -hmm. for so long but consumers order it and i know and this bartender here is going to recommend something as a replacement to that because he's like the sommelier is with wine he he wants some job satisfaction and doesn't just want to be someone that pours every you know major consumer brand he wants uh, you know to feel passion for his job and so i i made sure i instilled a part of that into every brand that i touched and you know, and, and part of it was making sure those brands spoke to the bartender in a way that they wanted. And that meant um, education. It, it meant they wanted to know the production. They wanted honesty. They didn't want, this is a secret recipe, a closely guarded secret. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of brands had that kind of mentality at the time. I said, no, tell them. They, fermentation is not a sexy story to the consumer. <laughs> I get it. But this bartender over here wants to know about it. Or at least if they ask the question, let's make sure everyone is equipped with the answer. You know, and that was sort of my, my approach. But once we'd done all of the possible education we possibly could on our own brand, in order to keep uh, engagement going, that was when the marketing really kicked in. I said, right, every, every bartender knows everything they need to know about these brands. Let's bring them more. And so that was when things like, you know, I don't know Bar Smarts was, you know, you know, you know, working with people like Nick Strangeway and Audrey Saunders on the gin symposiums, the gin posiums was all of that now going above and beyond and over and, 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 you know, over and above on the education piece. You know, my personal favorite experience doing um, a sensory analysis uh, lab with Grant Ackett's, you know, uh, where, which culminated in him bringing a linear on the road. And he bought the cocktails of aviary before they'd even opened the aviary on that tour and, and show people absurdly new and modern ways to present drinks that I didn't even never see. You know, I remember they did these um, hot toddies and on, and, and on that tour, they did a little tray that held the hot toddy, which had coffee beans in it that they roasted quickly and then they served it just so you would get an aroma. Just, you know, new, new bits and pieces like that. And I, and I thought to myself, if every time we do something we can inspire, then we'll be bringing something that could push our industry forward and they will remember us for it. So we sort of started tying in marketing into brand ambassadorship and education. But on the flip side, we looked at the marketing programs that uh, were being executed at a consumer level and decided to bring a higher level of cocktail execution and a higher level of education to those as well. So that if someone remembered just one thing about the quality of the brand, um, that, that would be great. Because before it was taglines, you know? Um, and, and I think that what happened is when Grey Goose came along and said the best tasting vodka, most other brands at the time had been sold on image. And here was one being sold on taste. And that was actually quite maverick of them. And, and, you know, and I knew in that moment we needed to step up and talk about production, taste, flavor, and all of the other things. So you were with Plymouth for 15 years. Like we're going to get into the 86 company now and Forge Gin. I always ask this question because I ask this question of a few people who have gone from like what people would consider as a pretty sweet gig <laughs> to risking it all and doing something else. Like uh, I talked to Jesse Veter about you're at Dead Rabbit and Blacktail and you give all that up to move to Singapore for Atlas. Like <laughs> why? So what, what made you like take, make the move from something that you've been doing for a decade and a half successfully at the top of your game to a lot of people to risk it all on a new venture? 
Yeah. Um, it, it comes from a multitude of places in all honesty. I don't think I was at, you know, a natural born entrepreneur, but I've always been fascinated by entrepreneurs. Um, I've never, you know, felt confident enough or that I had the, the ability to do it. So it was an insecurity more than anything. And, um, and so what really helped me with that was my business partner, Multibarnico, who, who was, he, he had that confidence uh, that he wanted to do it. He'd been to INSEAD business school and he was going to do it with or without me. And we developed the idea together. And, um, and just as we are you know, starting to think about it, he, uh, you know, just as we're starting to think about it, I get promoted within Puerto Rico to the cushiest gig of, that I've ever had in my life. I'm like, it's the first time I had a, you know, a salary that might give me a disposable income. You know, everything else was paycheck to paycheck up until that point. Right? I'm like, oh, wow. You know, I think that's the first time I didn't share an apartment with someone. I got my own studio apartment <laughs> in New York. You know, like that moment where you're like, I don't have to live with somebody. And growing up, you know, <laughs> I, I get that moment. And then I get that salary um, uh, from, uh, from this, this promotion at Perno. And, and everything's going well. I'm loving my job. I'm loving, the, you know, my time at the company. I'm loving the people I work with. And it's all good. But just, just a moment before that promotion, I'd been talking to my friend Malte about this idea um, of this, this company that would, that would take all of the input from the bartender community to make spirits for mixing. And that was really sort of the foundation of it. And Malte had gone to a business college and written the business plan to it. I'd written the marketing plan. He wrote the business plan. And there it was. Now, there was lots of layoffs in the company. Now, Malte was also working at Pona Ricard at the time. He was based in Sao Paulo. And um, there was a duplicate role. And so he, they asked if, him if he would move to Canada. And he didn't really want to move. He wanted to move to New York. Um, so they, they gave him six months notice. And so at six months notice, he said, right, I'm doing this. And I'm like, Malte, I really, I really wanted to do this with you, but <laughs> I'll help you uh, get it off the ground. But I'm, everything's going really well for me where I'm, where I'm, where I'm at. And, and what was happening at Pono for me is, I, 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 for some reason, they thought I was a good spokesperson, a good face for the company, a better brand ambassador than I was a better marketing person. And my creativity was being taken away from me internally as our, our group was evolving and what I've always you know my, you know I, I, I tie all of my my you know pride to um, the work I've created the programs I've designed the marketing campaigns I've executed I loved all of that as soon as I was a face for other people's work it just didn't feel feel right for me it felt dirty actually I, you know I only wanted to be the face of my own, own work and so I was being less creative and being much more of this outgoing personality and, and face for Perno Ricard. And that just didn't suit me. I wanted to get back to being creative. And so I put all of my creative energy into creating the 86 company. And when Malte was getting ready to launch it, he gave me one last chance, like you come in along or not. And I just, I was like, I gotta come along. I can't, I, can't, I just done all this work. I have to, I have to, I have to see this through. And so I gave up the paid gig and went back to, you know, like sharing an apartment and all of the things that you have to do, you know, from this moment where I thought I was going to get out of the rat race. Now I was firmly back in it, <laughs> you know, and that was, that would, that would be the, you know, after having this very cushy life on a nice uh, expense account, now it's going to be sleeping on people's couches and holding meetings, not at fancy restaurants, but you know, in cheap coffee shops. <laughs> and obviously you adapted and changed your perspective on things to make it happen. How, how long has 86 Company been around for now? Well, the idea was probably conceived in 2007, 2008, when we first came up with it. We didn't launch until 2012. The very first bottles uh, were sold in a bottle of Kanye Brava, uh, these now defunct brands, but a bottle of Kanye Brava rum and Ellsby Dove Vodka was sold in Texas in July of 2012. But the first bottle of Forge Gin significantly got sold in California to, uh, to a bar, uh, a bartender called Pablo Moir. You may have uh, come across him because he's like a, a sort of hidden genius out there in the Los Angeles bar scene with one of the best booze collections I know of. And um, he was the first 
purchased. We didn't even know about it. It ended up on a on an Instagram post or a Facebook post. I'm like, someone just bought the gin. I didn't even know it was available. <laughs> we, were, we were fighting with lawyers and, and distribu distributors trying to get our distribution, you know, um, situation negotiated. And there was a case, and we were in New York trying to figure out how to price post, which is a part of, um, uh, of, of launching a brand in New York that we didn't know about. We're like, why can't we sell any? You haven't posted your price. What's that? <laughs> so we, you know, we had, there's a lot of things to learn in, in, in the process of starting a brand. So um, the first bottle sold in September of 2012. So we did, we finally did a launch party and launched our company in December, 2012. So I guess our first, we only sold a few bottles that year. So our first real year was 2013. Wow. I didn't know. I, for some reason I've lost track of time because I didn't think it was that old. Yeah, no, the last, the last several years have gone like that. And, and, and they've been the hardest several years of my life. There's no two ways about it. You know, I, I've had less time with friends than I would have hoped, less time with family than I would have hoped, um, more time stressing where the next payroll was going to come, more stressed with the amount of debt that we were accumulating. I mean, it was never... It, I multi handled it very well, my business partner, and I just didn't handle it at all. Well, <laughs> that's the truth, what you know. You but at the same time, you know, you become your own personal problem solver. You become your own. Um, you, 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 your instinct for survival kicks in, and you start doing things. You know, one what I never did in these situations, and I'm really glad I didn't, was crawl under a rock and hope that all the problems went away. You know, instead, it was every week, how are we going to do this? How are we going to do this? And we were a great partnership, Malte and I, because I have a lot of ideas, but it, it takes someone with immense organizational skills, the thing I don't have, to get those done. And, and that was Malte. So we just made a great team. So you released, you had a rum, a tequila, a vodka, and Forge Gin. Yeah. And now Forge Gin is the only brand with the 86 company? Yeah. Was it just pure numbers over over business and passion and whatnot. So, I mean, this this I, I think that I was going through an identity crisis uh, when I launched the eighty six company. I was, you know, I. I love whiskey and I'm passionate about it. I think that if you gave me a blind, a blind tasting on cognacs, I would be able to pick all of the major brands. I, you know, I'm very good at it. I love Calvados. Uh, I've studied it. You know, I, I've been down to tequila so many times in my life and learned everything there is to know about that um, as a category. Whereas all I was being seen as was the gin guy. And, and so in that moment, I was like, no, I'm more than the, just the gin guy. I know my spirits, you know? And so I, you know, I, I, I wanted to jump out of my comfort zone of what I really knew very well. And of course, you know, going through the process of creating tequila cabeza, going through the process of, you know, um, you know, sourcing Ellsbury duck as we did, uh, going through the process of, um, of creating Kanye Brava rum with Don Pancho, all of those things were very fun and loose. You know, we were just going forward. We were making sure they were good. But the pressure I put on myself to make Forge Gin as perfect as I could, it never came naturally, the gin. I was always worried and always perfecting. And I think it's because my, I, you know, in, in that moment, I should have realized that deep down, I know gin better than I know anything mm -hmm. else. And the reason that I'm going into this level of detail with the gin and the reason the, the, the essence of the brand is going into so much detail and nothing was simplified. Everything was complicated. And, 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 and that to, to me was obviously, you know, when, when the brands all were launched, the, the one that was given the most um, critical acclaim was the gin. Uh, the one that had the best pricing and positioning was the gin. Um, you know, there were some tweaks that we needed to do to the mess messaging because we were in a rush to, to launch. But, you know, over the course of the next couple of years, I would sort of do those tweaks and, and the brand would start making sense to people that were purchasing it. Now, on the flip side, uh, you know, so we, there, there we are with this, 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 you know, near perfect gin, in my opinion, that remains, you know, perfect throughout the, its entire course of its ex existence. In the meantime... I'm learning about how to get consistency of quality on rum, which I didn't know, you know, even though the first batch is, is killer, batch two tastes a bit different. Same thing's happening on the tequila, right? And, and I never really wanted to get into the vodka game. That was, um, that was definitely driven by um, 
investors who were like everyone drinks vodka vodka's the easy win you know and 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 i and i totally missed the mark on my marketing there too you know by trying to be a bit irreverent and have fun with it in a world that was taking itself very seriously about vodka and the mark i missed was vodka drinkers take their drinks seriously of course they do i can't make fun of vodka to a vodka drinker <laughs> you know like so so i mean i, I definitely you know, see some of the mistakes i made and you know but all of the brands in all honesty tasted delicious and they all were met with critical acclaim but in 2015 the other three stopped growing they kind of got to a place they'd found their fan bases and then they plateaued whereas ford's gin just kept going and kept going it was a machine um and as the company and so what was happening is the other three were actually becoming a cash burden to the company you know in fact they were holding back ford's gin uh, and so, and, and so it was, it was tough and, and tequila prices and agave prices were going through the roof and all of a sudden our profitability on that brand was pretty much zero. So that, that again was a huge cash burden. So we, we couldn't really invest in growing any of our brands, even Ford's Gin, because we were spending so much on inventory. And so we had a flawed business model ultimately. And we sort of discovered that in that moment when the other brands stopped, stopped growing. Um, we didn't want to kill them because we didn't want that to be our reputation. Uh, they were all our children. You know, we started realizing that not all of them, we couldn't afford to put all of them to university. <laughs> Some of them were going to go and have to work in a factory to, you know, and, but we didn't want to get rid of any of them. And so that was sort of the, the feeling, but then we cash flow was so tight that we, and we were failing to get any investment that we realized we had a, a heap of inventory of the vodka and if we sold that inventory without reordering it that could pay for payroll and the running of the company so we killed the vodka first and you know and it's sort of and the others were slowly trickling and without any investment behind the brands the others then started to decline but mm -hmm. Ford just kept going and going and going you know so it was it was it was very you know the writing was on the wall and so before um you know you know i think around 2000 and 18 i'm starting to work up logos for the forge gin company we're going to turn the, the 86 company into the forge gin company that was that was the, the journey at that point you know the, a little bit of rebranding re never really got to get that out there into the world but uh, you know i did i did the work so as a drinks entrepreneur like i i think I think the reason why I may have held back on doing this interview with you was uh, you did such an amazing interview with um, Eric Castro and it was so raw. And I remember I was in Singapore and I was out for a run and I listened to that podcast while I was out for a run. And as, as an entrepreneur myself and I have had huge failures and great successes at the same time, um, it was just so raw. And I think the reason why I've held back, you said that at the very beginning is like, Oh, you must be running out of guests. It's like, <laughs> I didn't think I could pull, I didn't think I could do a better job that Eric had done in really bringing, because I think entrepreneurship is really fucking cool these days. Like people love yeah. being entrepreneurs, like they, they love having CEO on their card, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> and I think in the drinks business, it's really difficult because we, as a drinks business, we like to gloss over everything. Like we like to, to, to keep the happy face on. I talk about it during the pandemic, like how many restaurateurs are, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Like you can, like you, like you said, you have a, a meeting with your accountant and it's like, yeah, you're out of money, but then you've got to go do a training session and go schmooze a bunch of people two hours later. And you've got to put a big smile on your face and like push through it. And I think as a, as a drinks entrepreneur and hospitality entrepreneur, people see the outside looking in and they think, man, you're super successful. Like, and, but really in realistics, there's a lot of, really shitty times that you've just got to smile and sort of push through. You know, what's interesting about that interview with Eric Castro is we did two that day. It was interesting. Right. And, and one of them was me and Eric, you know, basically catching up old buddies. We used to work together on a couple of gin brands ourselves. You know, we, you know, I remember, you know, Eric back in the day being the guy with the, the you know, making high volume cocktail bars. He's, he'd been the guy that had introduced me to menus that actually went back to the old school, you know, sours, flips, punches, yeah. you know, and, 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 and so we were just sort of having fun, having a laugh and making fun of each other as we do. And then we sort of sat, you know, we had a quick coffee break and then we got back and sat down again and he asked me about entrepreneurship. And I walked out of that room going, the, 
you know, and I think I even texted Eric, I said, that first interview it was great. The second one sucked, man. You probably won't want to put it out. And, um, and, you know, the first one went out and I listened to it and it was entertaining enough. I didn't really get much from it, you know, personally, you yeah. know. And, um, you know, and, and, and so that's probably the assumption that no one else really did. And then the second one went out and I, I, I missed that it had gone out. And I was getting text messages and messages on Instagram about how, um, you know, wow, that's what it's like being an entrepreneur. And it was either one or two things. But one of three, really. One being, you know, there are people that are living the entrepreneur thing at the time and um, going through, very much going through the same things that I was going through and saying to me, thank you for saying that. You know, people think that as soon as you have a business that you're like loaded and whatever, and you're often the last person to, you know, you're often the last person to get paid being the owner. And then there were others who were thinking of starting a business and happy to know what they were getting into. And, um, and then I, you know, so it was, you know, it was, it was that. And then there were others that would have just seen our story you know, and, and you almost to try to take advantage of our company thinking we were super successful and apologized. It was really interesting, you know, you know, you know, because we, 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 we were trained as bartenders to, you know, and as bar owners and as bar managers to, to ask liquor companies for as much as we possibly can. Right. And of course, you know, and so I, I, at the 86 company, that's naturally what happened. We asked for everything. Even when we hadn't sold a single bottle, we were getting asked, well, what are you, what are you going to do for me? You know, like, you know, what's the deal on this? I'm like, I can't really do a deal. This is the best deal I got. I'm telling you about it now. What about a listing fee? I'm like, you know, I have no money for a listing fee. You know I mean? I can come and bartend for you one night. Or, <laughs> And it was a bit like that. And then, you know, people hearing the story go, oh, man, I'm so sorry. You know, I, 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 I get it now. Um, it, is a, it is a tough journey. Um, and that, that interview with Eric, you know, obviously inspired a few people. So I was, I was um, yeah, it, that, I'm glad I got it off my chest too, really. You know, because I, you know, you, I'm, I'm, I hold all my problems inside and never share them. I'm not one to write a big Facebook post about how terrible things are. I hate getting earnest. And it was so tough and the fight was so hard, but we persevered, you know, but there is a, a little bit of um, truth to it. And, and I, and I would say it to a friend over a beer and I'd say it to you over a martini down at Tales of the Cocktail, but I probably wouldn't share the story up until that point with, um, with Eric. So that was, that was quite an interesting, interesting moment for me. And, you know, to your point about the pandemic right now, I mean, if we go back, how we started this whole conversation, you know, watching, I don't know, Dick Bradsall and Dale DeGraff and Julie and Audrey and, you know, Jim Meehan and all these people that we know and, you know, the Jason Crawleys and, different, you know, yourself, different people around the world who laid the foundations to start this cocktail culture that at the time we thought we were going to be five bars in every city doing this, right? And it was a small little niche to, to actually get to a place where there are, Every great restaurant now has a cocktail menu. There are 50, 100 bars like in any major city and it turned into a, a total culture that gave people jobs and it gave people careers and gave people meaning and passion. And it's all coming crumbling down right now as a subsequent result of COVID-19, the, the fragility of, of what was built um, is is very it's heartbreaking actually this is is the correct term right now you know I, I i i've been i think the most fortunate thing that happened to me was i created a brand that had some that meant something of value to uh brown foreman um you know and 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 they came in and and felt that you know if we partnered we could take this and make this something that could be one of the biggest gin brands in the world over the course of the next 15, 20 years, you know, thinking of the long picture. And that's just my fate and a bit of luck that saved me because otherwise I wouldn't have a business either. And I'm watching friends struggle. I saw Jason Crawley post that he's selling his dream car today. He bought it, you know. Saw that. And, and it, I mean, that's heartbreaking, you know. Uh, I mean, there are people way worse off than, you know, having to sell your your car, you know, and so, you know, you know, not to belittle Jason's problem. That's his, you know, I know Jason so well, that's his commitment to his business and I love him for it. And I am heartbroken for him. You know, it is just, you know, there's just different levels of people struggling in all of this right now. 
would you have changed anything over the last decade of becoming an entrepreneur, taking the risk of your own brand, realizing certain mistakes and, and rectifying? Cause I think that's always a, that's always a hard thing for a lot of people to go, you know what? I, I, I biff this one. I'm going to have to, to nix the Aylesbury duck and the rums and the tequila. And, and I think there's always a struggle internally of like, how do people see that if you start dropping brands and, and focusing on one thing, um, would you have changed anything over the last 10 years? Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I've, I've never been one to say I have no regrets. I actually li have lived a life of plenty of regrets. <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I've made my mistakes and um, you know, and I, I certainly, you know, where, you know, will always hold my hand up and pay the consequences to the things that, that, that I've done wrong. And, um, and I hold myself accountable and I probably beat my, myself up too much about certain things that I do, but I did learn from everything. And I, and there's probably a hidden um, reason it happened to me in every single one of the scenarios. Um, I think my biggest regret was not understanding business, to be honest. I, you, you know, I, wanted to make sure, you know, I'm a socialist at heart. I wanted to make sure everybody that worked for me did well out of mm -hmm. the acquisition and out well out of building the company and not everybody did. And so I, I, you know, will often feel that, um, uh, that, that is a regret of mine, but I don't, I don't regret. Um, I only regret the outcome. You know, the, I, I, I thought, this is this is you know, to try and lighten it up. But I thought that giving people options instead of bonuses was a great thing because we were going to start, you know, like you know, like this is going to go to the stratosphere and every one of us were going to live on yachts. So of course, there there is that happens to Jeff Bezos and uh, you know a few other people, right? That's you know you you, you know it's you you just Entrepreneur Magazine sells a false story. <laughs> I, I like I used to love that magazine and now I hate it. it you know, like they. They, 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 they don't ever, ever put anyone that failed on the front cover. It's only people that, you know, so of course, you know, whereas you read statistics that's, you know, like that, whatever it is, like 90% of businesses fail, you know, 77% of businesses that have private equity fail. And, um, and yet all you do is read Entrepreneur Magazine and see all these really successful people, you know, so you just go, I'm going to be a billionaire. <laughs> you, want, you want to be the Elon, you want to be the Elon Musk of the spirits world. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, the journey, the fact that I got to make tequila cabeza is, uh, you know, be, and be a part of that project and, and the, uh, cabeza, the, the Sagrada that we did, that was a magical experience. You know, one could argue that if I hadn't been spending time on that, I would have been further building Ford's gin and, 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 and the business would have been in a better place. But, but I loved it. It was, it meant so much to me to do it, you know, being able to travel down to Panama and work with Don Pancho, who'd made rum all these years. I mean, it, that was like a dream come true, you know, you know, so, you know, money can't buy that experience. You know, it's, I, it's, it's hard to regret them, even though they were bad business decisions, you know, because we got to make something that meant something to even a small group of people. And it was delicious. And, and I learned um, a lot about brand identity and, and, uh, you know, the processes of and regulations and all those different things of all those different spirits. So it's definitely put me in a better place in, you know, you know, in where I am today, without a doubt. Um, you know, and, you know, and right now I'm, you know, very fortunate. I, I you know, I joined Brown Foreman a little over 10 months ago and I love it. I, you know, I, it's a, it's it's been nothing but one of the most pleasant work experiences of my life i mean you know that company has got something that that you know i i'm a very direct human being i'm a you know i, I beat up my team a little bit too much probably but um you know i've gone into a very convivial um put people first environment you know and i'm learning a lot in a short space of time you know from from being there but beyond that i'm actually just enjoying myself you know enjoying being a part of a company that cares about the community it does what it can you know um you know especially watching how it reacted to COVID-19 you know you know you could again panic put your head under a rock or come up with solutions and figure out how you can support your community and your business and all of those different things and that's what I've been witness to and actually beyond being witness to I've been involved they've involved me and I've been a part of it so 
you know, it's, I do have regrets. I do have regrets, but this led me to a place where I, I feel very fortunate to have accomplished a dream that, um, that I never thought I could. I still kind of think to myself, how, how, you know, how did I get here? Cause I've never been that ambitious and no one ever believes me when I say that, but the difference between ambition and hard work are probably not that, you know, that, that different, but I just have such a strong work ethic, you know? And I believe that if I'm working hard and, and, and doing my best to add value, then, then, then people will value me. I don't know where that comes from, but, um, so my work ethic's high, but at the same time, I never had dreams of being a CEO. I didn't care that it was written on my business card. In fact, it was really funny when, when, um, when all my business partners said, we want you now to take over from Malte as CEO. Malte had done seven years, which is a really long run for a CEO. He said, let's you know, bring Simon on. I'm like, nah, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I did it, so I can now say on LinkedIn that I was a CEO. <laughs> To be honest, I think my LinkedIn still says I'm a bartender. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I'm going to let you go really soon here, but what's, uh, what's your plan for the next six or 12 months? Now that you've sort of found some equilibrium with Brown Foreman and that sort of thing, what's the, what's the six or 12 month plan after like everything's sort of opening up now and hopefully we get back to the new normal, but what's your plan personally, career, everything? Yeah. So, I mean, my plan right now is forge gin, forge gin and more forge gin. Um, I created a, I definitely created a product, you know, a liquid that I'm absurdly proud of, a brand that I'm proud of that I always felt had a chance of being something, being a, a, a brand that, 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 that could actually be around forever. You know, I, I, I you know, for some reason believe, believe that, you know, and let's uh, say, you know, a little a little bit at, you know, out there to sort of think that you create something that has that chance. But what I realized as an entrepreneur is that I might not ever get given the chance to take it to that level and see if I can take this brand out for a spin uh, and really see if it works. And Brown Foreman have given me that opportunity. So I am now, you know, proud to be able to sort of spend the next six, 12 months introducing Forged Gin to Brown Foreman around the world uh, ultimately. So I'm creating um, infrastructure around the brand that we never had, you know, weird things like brand guidelines, maybe our first marketing campaign, things that I, all of these dreams I had even before we sold a single ball. I'm like, when we market this brand, I'm going to do this. <laughs> never had the money to do it. You know, we know when I have a brand, I'm going to do this. So um, now I get to bring some of those dreams to life through, uh, through um, Brown Foreman. And, and so I am incredibly great, grateful to them for, you know, being able to have that opportunity. So, you know, I'm still working night and day, you know, trying to think of ways to um, use Ford's Gin as an avenue to support the community, to bring fun and exciting things to our, our industry. Um, so that's why I, I don't see myself doing anything else for the next uh, six to 12 months. When, in terms of um, what we're going through with COVID-19, of course, it changes the narrative completely. I built a product that's entire business relies on the on-premise right and um and so our business like a lot of people's has gone away overnight so we've got to go back and start from scratch and i believe that working with the bartender community the hospitality industry to help rebuild is going to be a part of my my job uh, as as a as a representative of Ford's gin so um you know at the beginning i was panicking in all honesty you know, I was, I was, you know, going out and doing spends at every bar I could, donating to every bar, you know, thing that I could. And that had to be personal money, incidentally, right? So just donating and donating. And then I started doing um, family meal situation in here in Nashville for bartenders, mm -hmm. um, which again, I started doing that with my own money. But um, when Brown Foreman saw that, they said, no, we'll support this, which was amazing. And so we worked together and did family meal programs here. But that was all a little bit of panic, short-term panic, short-term panic. The, the bigger picture is how are we going to get back up on our feet as an industry? And that's going to be a little bit more of a marathon. and We're going to have to sort of sit down and really think about it. So I'm trying to find creative space um, to work on that too and how a brand could support that situation. You know, And the great thing is, is I have connections to people like you. I call Bobby Hugel a lot because his 
mind is fantastic in that respect, you know. You know, uh, well, I mean, he thinks deeply about these things, you know, and, 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 and it's great when you have people like that around, you know, as, as a as sounding board. So whenever I read one of his posts, I'm like, ah, I could have done that better. And it, and it has a it has the positive desired effect. I never get uh, defenseless, defensive, sorry, uh, about what he's he's writing. I think I think that's a fair and valid point, and we should address that uh, every time. So you know, he's a good guiding star. But then there are others that are like that. Um, so I would, you know, I do believe that we built something special with this industry, and I and I want to uh, see it be here and as long as I'm here, you know. So that's going to be. Goal number one is forged gin. Goal number two is that. But the two things go hand in hand. There's a synergy between, mm-hmm. between great cocktail bars and great gin. I mean, that's been that's been historic. That goes back to when people were first drinking martinis in the late, you know, 1900s. So, well, I really want to thank you for your time, man. Like, uh, I'm. I'm spoiled a little bit with the podcast, especially during this. I get to like talk to Charlotte and Gakuru last week and all this sort of stuff. And how Dave's, how is Gakuru? I haven't uh, liked, did that one go live? It was a lot. It was a lot of fun. So it was a I, lot used of fun. Share, I used to I used to share um, a, a a flat in Brixton, England, with John Gakuru <laughs> way back in the day. I think he was the he was running the lab bar in those days. <laughs> uh, and yeah, it was me, him, Jamie Terrell. I think, and Jody Terrell, J. Jamie's yeah. brother. Yeah, we we shared a place in Brixton. Good, good, good years. Those were the, the those were the days when you didn't care about the problems of the world. <laughs> I just I feel spoiled because I still feel like that uh, that super green twenty six year old Australian kid who moved to Canada in two thousand and six, uh, and amazing. Yeah, so amazing. I still feel like that kid. And so coming from Australia, where you're sort of disconnected from everybody, and you read about like. You like we were lucky enough. We got to meet. I got to meet Jacob Warriors like in two thousand and one. But yourself, Charlie Voisey, Philip Duff, and stuff like that. And now I get to class you guys as, as friends and mentors and peers. I'm, I'm just. I still am the giddy twenty six year old fanboy who is like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we ever get away from that though. You know, and and the one thing that I am, I, I I'm still a giddy fanboy when I'm sort of hanging around you know the sort of pioneers of this you know like i'll never get tired of a night out with peter dorelli and i calabresi and that will never tire me but at the same time the young kids that took the industry to another level and where we were you know uh, that that also you know like you know i remember first meeting don lee and you know like fat wash fat wash <laughs> you know you know but but i'm i'm excited for innovation i'm excited for new things you know you know i think you know you just have to be a little bit jealous that these guys are smarter and better better than you and they've taken it to the new level but Ooh. without them pushing those boundaries you know we, it was we went, funny because yesterday i was like because i got my lanyard collection right here and there's a key from the plymouth from one of the plymouth uh bartender breakfasts and this is my first year at Tails, which is 2011. Brilliant. What was that? And I was in the carousel bar before they renovated that whole end. It was still like black, ugly thing. And Duff walks up to me and he just shakes my hand and passes me that key. And it was the key to like jump the line and get into the bartender's breakfast. Amazing. It was my first year at Tails. It was the first nomination for Clive's. Isn't that the isn't that the party that we had shut down by the cops? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of those. <laughs> but mate, I really want to say thank you for the for your time. It was uh, I, I I'm being part of the entrepreneurship thing in the hospitality business. Uh, it's always nice to talk to other people who have gone through the same sort of shit and uh, <laughs> and bounce back and still live because there's days where especially when it first happens, you're just like, I just want to stay in bed. I don't want to, I don't want to get out of bed. I just want to, I want to curl up and have this all go away and, and be normal again. Yeah. And, 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 and there's some validity in doing that sometimes, but you know, you know, the, 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 the fighters are the ones that tend to persevere in, in this world. You know, that's the, you know, that's the reality. So sometimes you've got to slap yourself in the face and get, get up, get out and, and, and do it. Um, I think that's the, you know, I, I, I've always said there's only two things that really entrepreneurs do that's different to anyone else, and that's persevere and problem solve constantly, you know? 
and 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 let go of the glamour of what it was all about because I I, I honestly thought it'd be glamorous. I did because I read Entrepreneur magazine. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, well, uh, give love to your girls and uh, I'll chat to you really soon, my friend. Thanks, man. Bye, Bye. Thanks for listening, Pose Shifters. I well, hope you enjoyed that episode. I really enjoy sitting down with friends and peers and uh, just chatting about the industry and getting down to the nuts and bolts of what's really going on out there. Uh, make sure you like, subscribe, comment, everything on all the platforms. Just hit it up and I'll do my best to answer any queries or questions you have. I'll see you next week, guys. Bye.